my name is Josh Fraser. I'm one of the co-founders of Origin Protocol. And today we're going to talk about blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, cryptocurrencies, a whole bunch of buzzwords that are all the rage these days. Part particularly, I want to talk about the future of marketplaces and how blockchain technology has a chance to revolutionize everything we know about marketplaces today and change how marketplaces work in a very fundamental way. To, to start, I'd love to take a bit of a poll of a room uh, just to see where we're at. So how many of you here own Bitcoin? Wow, okay, good number of you. Ethereum or another cryptocurrency? How many of you have sent a transaction with any sort of cryptocurrency at all? All right, great, awesome. So we're gonna dive in uh, here. So since the creation of the internet, digital marketplaces have been bringing together buyers and sellers in ways that were never before possible. It started in 1995 with the launch of Craigslist, which took classifieds out of newspapers and put them on the World Wide Web. eBay, in the same year, 1995, took it one step further. They said the internet connects every human on the planet to every other human on the planet, and we're no longer confined to geography. Now you can transact with people no matter where they are across the globe. <coughs> Fast forward to today, and we have hundreds of examples of digital marketplaces. And the ones that we've, we're focusing on at Origin are ones in the sharing economy. And taking this idea that you can not only sell atomic units of goods, but now you can actually sell fractional usage of assets and services. And we have companies like Uber and Airbnb and Fiverr and Postmates and hundreds and hundreds more. And so the question we ask ourselves every day and a question I want you to think about today is this. What if? What if we could replace every one of these multi-million and multi-billion dollar companies with open source protocols? What if we could create marketplaces which are governed by a set of open and fair and transparent rules instead of a whims of corporate rulers. So we dub ourselves a sharing economy without intermediaries, using the blockchain uh, to get rid of the, the central uh, corporations that run these two-sided marketplaces. And there's four reasons that we think this is really important, and, is, and this is why we believe that this is an inevitable future. First reason is reducing fees. Now, most centralized marketplaces charge 20, 30, sometimes 40% of every transaction. Makes a lot of sense. Costs a lot of money to create a startup like Uber or Airbnb. But as if these companies have grown and have more and more of a monopolistic position in the market, have they decreased their fees? No. They take a larger and larger cut. And drivers on Uber today make less money than when they first started. And what blockchain allows is this chance for us to replace the primary function of any marketplace, which is an introduction. Buyer meets seller. Blockchain gives us a place where buyer and seller can meet each other without having to pay fees to a middleman. Oops. The second benefit is we get a chance to reduce censorship. So what we've seen with Uber is they've been banned in cities all over the world. You can't get an Uber in London today. You can't get one in Vancouver. They were banned in Austin, Texas for a while. Um, same for Airbnb. They've been heavily regulated and banned in cities all across the world. And the reason this is possible is because these corporations present a single point of failure. So take Airbnb in San Francisco, for example. They had uh, San Francisco passed a law saying that you have to be registered to host on Airbnb. Despite those laws, 4,000 people were listing re unregistered apartments in San Francisco. And then just within the last month, those 4,000 listings disappeared from the site. Because the city of San Francisco decided to go after Airbnb and start finding them. $1,000 a day for every unregistered listing, and poof, just like that, 4,000 listings disappeared. 
So we can't change velas, but we can change that single, and we can remove that single point of failure. We're overzealous. Governments can't come in and shut everything down with one fell swoop. And it's not only overzealous governments that we have to worry about. Sometimes these companies themselves like to pick and choose favorites on who is and isn't welcome on their platforms. Now think back to the old world where we used to take taxis to get around. It would be inconceivable that something that you would post on social media would mean that you would never be able to get into a taxi again in your life. It's inconceivable that you would be able to post something on Facebook or Twitter and never be able to enter a hotel again. But that's the crazy world we find ourselves in today, where companies like Uber and Airbnb and Lyft have banned people for life from ever using their services for stuff that they have post on, posted on social media that they thought was not in line with um, the, you know, the spirit of their companies, and these individuals have been banned for life with absolutely no recourse. And we never, and everyone applauded on how Airbnb is clamping down on hate speech, and we never stopped to have a conversation and say, is that the kind of power that we want to give these corporations? The third thing, when we think about how do we, you know, going up against multi-million, multi-billion dollar companies, we think about how do you incentivize people to, to help make that a reality? And more importantly, how do we redistribute the value more equitably? Think about the first 100 drivers on Uber. The company wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for those first 100 drivers. What would they get for it, right? We're likely still driving for Uber today. Take the first 100 Airbnb hosts. Think about the first 100 users of any sharing economy marketplace. How much upside do those individuals have when these companies IPO someday. But meanwhile, the investors get rich, the early employees get rich, everyone, and everyone else who's involved with these companies are going to make a killing. But what about those people who are contributing the most to the creation of that marketplace? And crypto economics gives us a way to incentivize people to care, to incentivize people to use a platform and to tell everyone they know to use a platform, even in the early days. When, let's face it, the experience of, of buying something and using cryptocurrency is a little bit more difficult and a little bit more painful than the existing services we have. An example is once you bought your first Bitcoin, your first Ethereum, and it started going up, you went out and you started telling everyone you knew about it because you now have a vested stake in that network. And the same thing is true in these new digital marketplaces of the future where the suppliers and the buyers will actually have a vested interest in the success of the network. The other thing I love to remind people of, and I, I know I've been talking about Uber and Airbnb as these examples over and over again, but that's not where we start. This is not where, you know, this is not where it starts. It starts with the two billion people on this planet who are completely unbanked today. Most centralized marketplaces have a prerequisite that you have a bank account, that you have a credit card, or else you're completely cut out from transacting uh, on, online. But a growing number of those 2 billion people who don't have bank accounts, guess what? They have cheap Android phones. And if you don't have one today, uh, they'll have one in the near future, and certainly someone in their friend group will have one as well. And by the fact that they have access to a phone, it means they have access to digital currency. And for billions of people on this planet, their very first interaction with a digital marketplace of any kind will be on a decentralized marketplace that's powered by a cryptocurrency. So a few other problems we have with centralized marketplaces that decentralized marketplaces can solve. First one is the data is siloed and proprietary. We see this at Facebook uh, in the last week. We see the dangers of having all of that data controlled by one entity and what happens when that goes wrong. And for you as a user, 
you have to have different accounts and different usernames and passwords for each of the different services that you use. But in the blockchain, everything can be open and you can own your own data and control your own data. You can, you can be self-sovereign in that regard. We also see there's an unfair value capture. These companies make it their business to take your data and control it instead of um, doing what's in your best interest uh, for your data. And where does this lead us? It leads to a lack of innovation. And we see this over and over again, where as companies get more and more control, more and more power, they end up looking more and more like Comcast. The le more of a monopoly position you have, the less need you have to innovate and improve things. And of course, we already talked a little bit about this, but there's, you, now you're at the whims of arbitrary rule changes. Just ask anyone who's selling on Etsy and worried about getting kicked off a platform for life for breaking one of the arbitrary rules that are always changing on their services. So how do we solve it? What is the solution and how can we build decentralized marketplaces on the blockchain? And so what we're building at Origin is, is really three things. First thing is a protocol. We're saying what if we could create something like SMTP is to email, and except it's Origin, which is for buying and transacting on any sort of marketplace. So we're developing a protocol, we're creating a platform for other decentralized marketplaces to be able to build on. And you can think of it a little bit like Stripe, J, like Stripe where they have uh, a library that abstracts away all of the complexity of dealing with old school financial systems. And now for the average developer, you can take in 10 minutes, you can get up and running and start accepting credit cards. So we're doing the same thing, except on the blockchain, so that any developer can get up and running with their own decentralized marketplace in a very short amount of time. And most importantly of all, we're building a community. We're building a community of people who are excited about this future, this decentralized future, where we remove rent-seeking middlemen from the equation, and we create truly peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces that aren't owned or controlled by anyone. So how do we do this? Now, what is the technology? How, how is this even possible? So we're built on top of Ethereum and a distrib distributed file system called IPFS. And this is a peer-to-peer -peer file system. And Ethereum, of course, is a blockchain, a second largest cryptocurrency out there. And it's, we're creating this completely open source peer-to-peer -peer, um, network that you can create your own marketplace on. And so to explain a little bit about how this works, I want to start with Bitcoin and how Bitcoin works. So many of you uh, may not know this, but Bitcoin was actually not the first digital currency that was created. There were a lot of attempts in the past to create digital currencies. But they all had this problem, and I think you can probably all guess what it is. And that it's called, um, and the problem is, is that digital files are very easy to copy. Right? You can have a file on your computer and you can do control C, control V, and now you've got two copies of it. Well, that digital file is your money. We have a problem because now your money, can, you can duplicate your money anytime and no one will trust it. And so the fundamental innovation of Bitcoin was solving what's called the double spend problem. And we figured out this innovative way where we can make sure that money only gets spent once. And the way it works is really actually simple and, and elegant. We have a ledger. And the ledger takes a track, keeps track of everyone's address and how much money they have. But how do we stop people from cheating? Well, the way Bitcoin solved this problem is they said, well, we'll just have 10,000, we'll have thousands of computers all over the world that all keep a copy of this ledger. And now we'll all know exactly how much uh, money everyone has, and we'll use consensus algorithms and economic incentives to make sure that uh, people keep mining this and that this network is secure. And it's turned out to work incredibly well. Now, fast forward a few years, and a guy named Vitalik Buterin came along, and he looked at Bitcoin and he said, huh, this is interesting. If we take this distrib distributed ledger, we could store more in it than just like, balances on how much money everyone has. What if we stored the internal state of a computer into this distributed ledger? 
And this was a, a, no, a really novel idea, and it, it turned out to be um, unlock it, it turned out to unlock a whole new class of problems that have never been solvable in human history. And that means that we can build on top of this decentralized computer, and we can all come to consensus and agree on the state of the world. And so what this allows is when you're looking at creating a marketplace, now we have a way to keep track of who bought what when. We can keep track of who's staying in an apartment on which nights. And we have a way to, end, you know, without any chance of anyone messing with it, we have a way to find each other and transact with each other right on top of this uh, distributed computer that we have on the Ethereum network. So like I said, we're building a couple of different components. One is Origin.js. This JavaScript library that connects to the Ethereum network. And we're creating this uh, DAP or decentralized application that connects to IPFS and uh, Ethereum and allows people to create their own marketplaces. And so I want to give you a quick demo here on how this works. If you can start the video for me, that'd be great. Oh, here we go. So, what we're doing, so this is like a, a very simple Craigslist style marketplace is built on top of Origin. It doesn't look like very much at all, but you can create a listing. We use something, a Mozilla project called JSON Schema, which allows us to have unaffiliated parties uh, speaking the same language and using the same standards so that we can uh, verify that listings are valid. And so you can add your apartment that's available uh, for rent. You can put it here. And when you save it, it's not going to a central server. There is no central server at all. On the front end, you have HTML and JavaScript. And then that, that application connects directly to the blockchain, connects directly to the decentralized file system. And so now we see we have this um, room is posted up. Now, in this case, we have to use MetaMask. MetaMask is a browser add-on for Chrome that allows you to digitally sign that. It's a wallet that you can store in your browser. So we can see if this post here. It's been accepted by the Ethereum network. We can go browse the listings. And there we have it. So now we have our listing that's stored on the blockchain. Anyone in the world can go browse this, book this, and we can develop on this to create um, marketplaces of all sorts and types. So today we have over 35 partners that have already committed to building on top of the Origin protocol. Now a lot of these are other crypto projects, uh, like BTOKEN is here in San Francisco. Engineers from Uber and Facebook and Google left to tackle the home sharing uh, category, and they're building on top of Origin protocol. We also have traditional businesses. We have hundreds of thousands of users, like Service Hero, which are massive in Southeast Asia hundreds of thousands of users for reporting their business to the blockchain and we're going to be building on top of Origin. We have Galaxy eSolutions, which is doing $20 million a year in revenue, doing selling refurbished phones, and again, building on top of these open source protocols that I'm talking about today. And so this future that I'm talking about is far closer than most people realize. Decentralized marketplaces are here. And what we're looking for are developers who want to help us continue building uh, this technology. Marketplace businesses, like many of you in this room, we're looking for people who are interested in the blockchain and how you can, you know, how this fits in with your business. We'd love to chat with you about that. Uh, and also strategic partners, people who want to, who are interested in cryptocurrency and want to learn more about what this looks like in the future. So that's, that's all. I'll take uh, questions if you have any.
treat everyone fairly, doesn't that actually prohibit innovation to a degree? I think what we, what we have is a chance to explore multiple futures. Because we have open source software, anyone can adjust it and fork it and take their own version of it anytime they want. Right? It gives us a, a new way to pursue multiple different futures at the same time. So we're putting out our first set of rules on how we think a, you know, the open and fair marketplace should be governed. But if people don't like that, or if we get things wrong, um, we, can, we can pivot and other people can fork our code and they can have their own version. Um, and if theirs is better, then people will switch and start using that. And so it gives us a unique way to explore these different alternative futures in parallel. Um, versus, you know, most corporations can only get a chance to sort of pursue one or two things at a time, right? They get to make a bet on one future uh, idea or one, one sort of project at a time, and may, if they get it wrong, they waste a lot of time and resources. But in this sort of whole new world of blockchain, we have this advantage of being able to, to try things out in parallel. Yeah. So um, fair and efficient marketplaces usually need to be curated. In this kind of environment, how do you go about curating the market? So we're creating, uh, I think the answer to that will be, we'll see. <laughs> um, we're, you know, again, we're looking at um, what are the different ways that people want to break down different types of listings. So, you know, in some cases, you'll want to break it down by geography would be a, a good way to do it. Some by price, some by, um, you know, different brands that would still be associated with it. Um, and so we're creating this platform that other marketplaces can build on top of, except we have a shared data layer where the data that you're, um, is portable between all these different marketplaces. And so it makes it a lot easier for users um, to move across these different marketplaces. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of people in this room are founders who are rent seekers, and others are investors who profit from rent seekers. So um, what? I am fully aware of the room I walked <laughs> into. <laughs> What's the incentive for uh, for us to uh, participate in this uh, protocol? Yeah. So it's it's a good question. So I think uh, the best examples of the companies we're working with already that are porting their businesses to the blockchain. Um, some of them are interested in being able to do their own token sale as a new fundraising, a way, new way of doing fundraising, cutting out a different set of gatekeepers, which are the VCs in this room, who can tell them no. And a lot of people are excited about the fact of being able to go direct to retail investors and, and say, hey, if you believe in what we're doing, you can have a chance of doing that. And it's a, you know, ICOs provide a new fundraising mechanism for them. But the problem is you can't just, do, you can't just go out and raise $50 million because you want to do an ICO. You actually have to buy into this decentralized future. And so a lot of businesses are looking at this, one, as a fundraising opportunity. Two, a lot of businesses are saying, we believe in the future. We, we, it's obvious this is coming far faster than most people realize. And we can either cannibalize our own business or we can um, ha be cannibalized. And I think that's the you know, classic innovator's dilemma that a lot of people are starting to think about. Yeah. How do you guys protect against bad actors hijacking the entire system? Given that you're saying basically your data is stored and available everywhere, you set up, we have a group favorite from uh, set of files to uh, you know, sure. smugglers sure. uh, deciding to make it a protocol du jour. Sure. Sure. No, it's a very important question. How do we keep this uh, a network, a uh, marketplace, somewhere where people want to transact? If it's filled up with scammers and bad actors, no one's going to want to use it, right? If you go and every time you book something, you end up getting scammed, we're going to be a complete failure. So the way we think about it is, like a lot of things in blockchain, with incentive mechanisms. So this goes into you know, so po both positive and negative incentives. So on the positive side, we can incentivize people to do behaviors we want. Making bookings, you can get a cashback reward. Leaving a review, cashback reward. Inviting your friends, one of the best things you can do for any sort of marketplace, cashback reward. On the flip side, we can have you do something called staking, basically leaving a deposit when you publish your listing. And then if the community votes that you're fraudulent or you're a bad actor or you're putting up content that um, shouldn't be a part of the network, then you'll forfeit 
those tokens that you've staked. And in that way, we can have a system that is um, continuing to grow and is healthy, and that we have systems for dealing with content which shouldn't be a part of the network. So I think the, yeah, so we're, how, how, do, how do these businesses make money? The, we have a revolutionary new business model with token economics. And the idea is that you can, for, for most of our partners who, are, who we're talking to, they're looking at, okay, we're creating our own currency that will be built, you know, that will be used on top of Origin. And those companies are um, lar the largest holders of that currency. And as that, since that currency is something that is critical to the operation of their marketplace, as more and more people start using the marketplace, limited supply, demand goes up, the value of that token will go up as well. And so that's the whole premise. It's largely untested, we, but this is largely the, the premise of most uh, blockchain projects out there today, is this idea of token economics, that you have some sort of API key that as more and more people use your service, that demand for that is going to, that key is going to go up, limited supply, and that is how you can make money. It's a very different business model from anything else that we have today. Now, a lot of our partners are also saying, you know what, we have extra fees. We provide extra services besides just making an introduction. We have arbitration, customer support. We have other things that we, that we offer, and we're going to charge a fee on top. Now, maybe it's not the 20, 30, 40% that traditional marketplaces are offering, um, but there's certainly nothing stopping people from charging a, a reasonable fee on top. And so I think we're going to see a bit of a hybrid um, between people taking very sort of traditional business models of charging fees and people who are, you know, going all in on token economics and sort of this new crazy business model that it provides. Yes? Yeah, I think there's the existential threat for all of these businesses building on blockchain right now is that Ethereum doesn't scale very well. Um, that said, there are a number of really good efforts um, to improve the performance of Ethereum. Right now, the Ethereum network handles about 15 transactions a second. That's not going to cut it for really anything, right? Um, and so we, we've seen examples of crypto kitties uh, crippling uh, Ethereum network. So, but that said, I, I wouldn't bet against the Ethereum community. Um, they have the strongest community. They have incredibly strong developers. There's a lot of initiatives like Plasma. Um, the Misi Go team are working on the first implementation of that. It's coming along quite well from what I hear. Uh, there's other you know, initiatives around sharding um, that are also really promising as well. So we're very bullish that um, Ethereum is going to be able to figure this out. Uh, and if not, there are lots of other blockchains that are also in development that are promising to have um, better performance. Um, today, none of them have a community that's even close to the community that we have around Ethereum. But if and when one of them surpasses Ethereum, both on technology capabilities and also community around it, um, we're totally uh, open to switching to another blockchain and we're, we're able to do that as a sort of middleware uh, between the two. Thank you.